Welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Today we have our lecture 9 on Platform as a Service. And uh, this PaaS idea of essentially cloud models is one of those three famous ones, the infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, that basically stand the test of time. Already in the last lecture, we had essentially the infrastructure as a service model, and let us review what we had there for the last time before we then come today to the platform as a service. And we see that some of the elements are really overlapping. And we learned that the last time when we said, well, infrastructure in our mind is really the bottom layer here. You would say some entity of compute, block storage network, and then a smart virtualization scheme on top, of course, which enables us to do, you know, basically resource sharing, multi-tenant ideas, all what we had in the virtualization lecture, lecture four. So when you're doing this, um, basically on that level, having an interesting scheme then on this virtualization, you're also very quickly in thinking about what software you provide more generally inside this AMI images, for instance, for deep learning. We learned this already in one of the previous lectures. Or essentially, do you have a MapReduce engine that you want to do? But coming back to the idea here, and I think that's something, again, compute, you know from several, let's say, lectures we had already earlier to start early with the assignments in Amazon and so on, and to have some practical lectures, that essentially this standing for such a building block that we already know, um, as an example here in Amazon, of course, think about that similar entities we have seen with MS Azure and so on. So also the Google Cloud Platform, I will start today a little bit more to look into. I have, of course, also similar ideas. So the infrastructure as a service model is, of course, supported by all hypervisors, uh, sorry, hyperscalers these days. And of course, also, we have learned that some Icelandic providers in the last lectures have also lots of services there to offer. Now, <clears throat> from the storage, we also had used uh, basically lecture eight to look more on infrastructure. It doesn't have to be block storage. We have also seen a bit so more higher level sort of storages like object storages. We have seen here the AWS three. And here it's already starts with exactly the point I want to make also later with MapReduce here, that there is no strict boundary where you say that's infrastructure, that's platform, right? And there's where the application starts. So I would say these days, you would see these are quite intertwined. Still, they capture a little bit the assets of what's happening that for a platform, you have something you can give to multiple users um, in sort of a higher level service or something which is not directly just a basic functionality you want to do on the lowest level. Hence, the object storage add here a little bit the capability on top of the virtualization layer, if you remember, to a sort of an object storage with key value pairs. Uh, metadata, different interfaces, as I was saying also last time, S3 has become more or less a sort of de facto standard in the community for, as an interface, um, which many different, um, let's say, software solutions that are even not Amazon only um, basically implement to be compatible and interoperable with the S3 storages. And <clears throat> you can go on and go on, go to databases. We have the notion database as a service last time discussed in our lecture. That, of course, these are now points where um, many people have invented funny names of putting an AAS somewhere onto it, um, while these three basically are the, let's say, the, the initial ones where applications really stand more or less for the software as a service level. But, uh, of course, you can imagine that the database sharing data as a service might be also possible, right? The I think as a service notion comes with it, that you basically have a chance that many users can access the database in a very convenient way and maybe even have to swap the credit card to basically get access to it. So just putting their MySQL database uh, behind a firewall would be not basically as a service. Um, and that is something how you could imagine this. Just to allude again to infrastructure as a service lecture last time, we have also discussed in other ideas of how to store it data again. We use the AWS storage um, basically to, to show you then what different types of storages exist. We have also seen in Elastic File System, uh, the Amazon S3, um, and all, of course, have the interesting notion beneath that, um, firstly, you <clears throat> have inherent scalability, 
Um, that is, of course, one of the benefits of these solutions that you have a file system, which in the end you can expand, 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 uh, it's similar like the S3 interface, right? This also can be, the bucket can be bigger and bigger or shrink again, depending on your needs. And this is, of course, something which you, when you have your own hardware to buy in your own seller of a company or in your own data center, you have still the hardware, even if you don't use it, right? And here the idea is you can shrink, you can maybe quickly adopt to change and then for a couple of months expand heavily, but then you shrink again. So sort of the flexibility where clouds stand for are really, again, inherent. Just one thing, uh, when I said to you, be careful in some of the schemes, we will talk about this today again. The transfer, transfer in and out of clouds also costs these days. So when we talk about, for instance, an API usage, you see here the REST interface based on HTTP, put, copy, post, and so on. Per thousand requests, you actually have, depending on different zones, uh, quite some money you have to, to reserve for it. Also, if you think about putting here something out of a glacier, we discussed this as a long-term storage. Here you go, you have quite some money, even if it's just 1,000 requests, but think about a game, you know, like we will discover today when we think about Angry Birds or something that you have lots of data to take out, take in, take out. So this is, of course, also a scheme that could accumulate and that you have to somehow incorporate in your prices. Because it's very important to think about, I want to just I want to do one point more because this is now perfectly leading on to our platform as a service lecture today. We discussed also MapReduce in earlier lectures, and then we never really discussed of how you directly, you know, when you're self-responsible of getting to it to get an installation, uh, how you, what which option you actually can do. I put you there with HD Insight. You used basically that one. There was a MapReduce, there was Spark and so on, and it's equally standing here for this Apache Spark stacks. The point is that you have different options, right, to go to. And when you think about that, you have this on-premise, you would buy your own hardware, full custom, you have to install everything. Um, this is already lots of work and basically based on quite bare metal, you have to actually buy in your own company. If you do then the MapReduce appliances, you're already, of course, going towards the virtualization, which would you basically also, I think, in a company really quickly do. You still have your own hardware, but then you have a virtualization layer that maybe enables you to get images from MapReduce already um, and then basically start appliances, instances which are based on the configuration of, you know, already images existing in the community. Then you can maybe cross the border a little bit and say, well, let's let's have someone else doing this for me right a specific organization uh, let's say long term uh, isp internet service provider whatever that can't basically host for us the map reduce engine um, that would be nice so we have the infrastructure there we have then the hosting of this map reduce engine there and all what we need to do is basically having our applications then get access to the map reduce hosting and this is already almost a cloud model, but it would be at now a very specific uh, one tenant oriented model, exclusive basically for your family, uh, for your for your company or whatever family organization. Um, but if you really start then big, um, you would consider something that we already learned like HD Insight maybe, and then you're really deep in the cloud. You have it as a service. Also the implementations of the MapReduce applications um, might be already there partly with all the different stacks we discussed, right? So um, let's say Apache HBase, we touch base on again today. So there's a full continuum here in a way, going from bare model over to virtualization and then to fully cloud solutions. And you can imagine all have their unique selling propositions, their costs in hardware versus costs in software and, and subscription models. And of course, this is some of something you within the company being responsible have to think about. And of course, then the point to the platform as a service is exactly this. So for some, you would say MapReduce is just an infrastructure, right? For application people, I want to use MapReduce for doing my machine learning. I want MapReduce for doing my summary statistics. So for people in the application layer, application scientists, this is a platform. It's not just infrastructure, a little bit of hardware running there. There's a fully managed maybe software solution, and I want to use this as a platform. Hence. The differences between infrastructure and platform can be quite, let's say, overlapping. And this is a very good example. 
Hence, today we come back to this conceptual lecture on, on PaaS. I already said it's a bit late in this course because we put an emphasis on practical topics before so that you can start with assignment one and assignment two. But we have to talk about some of the PaaS concepts. It's really something that you need to know. And I would like to bring across several different pieces here in order to make the point where PaaS environments can really be of use. One is this Lego brick idea that I already discussed with some students actually in the side of break that you have here really a solution tool for developers, right? The pass level is almost something like, you know, oriented towards developers, application developers, uh, even if you want to do your own app, right? The Google app engine helps you there. We will discuss it uh, briefly. Of course, you can have these days uh, a complete seminars on the Google app engine and to master this topic. And I also would like to bring across a small, let's say, interesting topic on new SQL databases, also known as key value stores, column stores, and so on, and why they basically are quite competitive if you compare to the typical SQL database. If I would be in class, I would ask you, have, do you know something about the structured query language? Have you know databases with large schema and so on, where everything is stored in a so-called relational database, having you know, fixed tables and so on, it was fixed fields, while NoSQL databases are quite a more modern topic of saying we don't need fields for everything, we just store what we have. And I will make a point of it later on. We look at some pricing, of course, which varies a lot in the clouds, as you already know, um, but of course gives you also a fully managed solution again to have the whole development cycle um, supported. And this is something what I brought, want to bring across in the second part, when we talk about the advanced pass topics, think about that you are the developer using the pass Lego bricks to create basically your application, whatever it is. Um, there's change, dynamic adaptation needed. Over time, uh, you have a next version, a next version, or you adapt to different, let's say, ideas. Think about Angry Birds. That, I mean, many of you know, I guess, and I don't even here in the class normally have to uh, you know, ask and if someone actually doesn't know that. But you know also that there's a Star Wars version. There's a whatever version on Halloween probably right now. So there are different versions with having the underlying similar structure of this. Hence, it becomes a software engineering process we talk about. And this needs to be done in the cloud. It needs to be you know uploaded to the Google Store, et cetera, et cetera, that people can use it. So this is all supported then nicely with SDKs with within the Google Cloud. And we will give some, let's say, examples related to machine learning again with natural language processing and sentiment analysis, but also we'll have here and there some application examples. Also here and there, I would like to bring across some specifics, as I told you in, in these um, lectures, um, because we're moving quite heavily now already into the application space, right? As you remember, we're moving a bay away a bit from the infrastructure. So somehow the CPUs, each storages disappear a bit um, and being basically exchanged with higher level services like memcache or basically different databases we will allude to in Google. Hence, here and there, it's also good to, to look under the hood. I will explain a little bit what's there, but take away the message that in PaaS, normally the developers using PaaS uh, want to abstract really a little bit also from the infrastructure, the service layer to create maybe SaaS solutions. So you see again, all of that is connected. Hence, come we focus here on this lecture, obviously on the platform as a service. Um, you would say the virtual images that we already discussed uh, might be something for creating your own deep learning aspects. So there you could say again, is that already platform as a service or is this infrastructure as a service? Um, and when you now look into the Google Cloud, this is now a bit new, I didn't really introduce that yet. I said always this is one of the big three, if you want, right from the um, hyperscalers. Um, there's lots of things to offer on the Google Cloud. That's why I made the point here. Um, I would encourage you maybe to log into this particular one, the Google Cloud. It's not the Google Collaboratory, right? It's not the Google Collab service we used already and showed a little bit before. Here I talk about the real Google Cloud um, that you basically have as another set of services there. And uh, they have, of course, services on all these different layers. And again, when we focus a little bit today on, on developing applications, I was making the point already in Infrastructure 8, uh, Infrastructure Service um, Lecture 8, where we said, okay, we have a billing service that we might combine with a 
you know, launching some task uh, somewhere in your app game or so that you monitor the quality of service. And this is all related to the lower level on the infrastructures. You see data as a service idea. So this is all something where you would say it's on the infrastructure of the service level. But today, we really abstract from this and have different Lego pieces. You see some of them here, right? This would be the Lego pieces you uniquely combine in the Google Cloud to create some SaaS solution, which then, of course, requires a nice client interface. But all the solution tools, the Lego bricks, the building blocks of your application are basically in the pass level. And, and this is a common paradigm. You see that a little bit of another explanation here so service hardware network and send and so n etc etc they have the pass level here where you then have all the development tools database management and then operating systems checking you know is a you know security updates and so on this is what you would say is rather on the pass level before we then come to the hosted applications completely in the next lecture it's also very common to operate there with many development languages. So here we are in the space of really thinking again about Python, uh, Java, Ruby, REST interfaces, um, JSON formats. So many of them are even did listed here and we will allude to. So it's more the area of developers thinking about APIs, thinking about uh, software development kits, application programming for basically creating your application solution. And you have here a quite nice example, um, Spotify, where you also see if you grow with your demands, you may be also able to move between these different cloud providers. You see here one statement we had also earlier that AWS Elastic MapReduce that you already know from earlier lectures with Spark and so on was really used in, in different applications here in Airbnb applications with 50 gigabytes per day and Spotify applications also to use 16 million songs. Now, time increased over the and, and over their, let's say, increased usage, they see more and more demand for basically moving also to other clouds. So you see here that um, another statement more recently here uh, that basically um, Google Cloud helps Spotify support millions of requests, etc., to global listeners. So you see, basically, there was a move from AWS to Google Cloud in some respect, not maybe in all of that. And the detailed secrets you maybe never know, right, because it's a company. But of course, here and there, you see that testimonials also help the hyperscalers and big ones to really, let's say, um, get credit from big, um, let's say, players from applications that, of course, is a good marketing channel, right, to say, well, they're using our platform in the Google Cloud, enabling then basically Spotify things you already use, maybe potentially daily, uh, like we do in our family. And you see here a video, I don't play it um, today. Please have a look at it. There's a reference to it, Spotify and Google Cloud. And, and this should bring across a message that as your business grows, of course, you have to think that maybe you accumulate data more and more heavily, maybe price changes, or you basically have different cloud providers that have you even, you know, can offer you much better services on the platform as a service level, maybe better machine learning models and so on. And there are different ways um, here also think about, um, you know, health sector that is using the Google Cloud or IKEA that many of you know also basically have this Google Cloud idea where you have lots of apps where you can already design your interiors and so on based on IKEA, uh, um, you know, basically furniture. So now coming again to the ideas of categories. So coming also, what I said in the beginning, I also want to give you some links to the lower levels, right? When you come to the Google Cloud, of course, they also offer services on the infrastructure as a service level. You see here quite a lot VM instances that you already know from lecture four. There's one specific one, TPUs, we talk about this later, the Tensor Processing Unit, a very interesting idea of a, a very specific processor developed by Google that is actually not something you can buy and put in your own cluster at home. Um, but it's very oriented towards, as the name suggests, tensor, tensors, multidimensional arrays, and so on. You see also some instance templates. It is something like the images we discussed, machine images to really then have, of course, in different images already prepared. And you, you can imagine we're using this again um, for machine learning for different aspects, very much like the AWS AMI that we have seen. Of course, this is not where then basically pass plays, but of course, pass requires 
this. So you see here in this interesting, more development oriented uh, slide that you need the infrastructure as a service layer, of course, in the Google Cloud. You cannot just do a path layer without any computing or data that you just have seen, right? So here you see the App Engine Admin Console, which is quite central if you use the Google App Engine. And then you, as a web application provider, really have the possibility to connect all these different Lego bricks that you now would have within this App Engine Admin Console for your developments. And as I said, also, this is a cyclic process. You usually build using, you know, basically your different uh, languages, you upgrade, you have different versions of this, you deploy it into the cloud. So being at basically a Bay label now on the cloud, and then you test it and of course make it available also in the Google Play, for instance, to get then daily requests um, from your different, let's say, application and users that you have here, mostly via HTTP requests to the user interface. Of course, you as a developer have a very specific access with the App Engine Admin Console, but the whole process you see here is very much optimized to really bring your solution into the cloud and then, for instance, also in the App Store that you know from Google Play. There's also different apps that you can tune to different locations. You see that a little bit, of course, depending on where your users are. We discussed this already a little bit in one of the lectures that region matters, depending on how often you basically also download your data from the cloud. And I put here some applications just as examples. Of course, if you look into Google Play and others, they have tons of different applications. These are those that I want to discuss briefly today. And when you now look into the Google App Engine, uh, what, what is it? What is it as pass? Um, of course, I just cannot spend, uh, let's say, the whole uh, lecture just on that, but it is something which is really automatically enables you the scalability, right? When you have now, let's say, a couple of app users, um, you probably think you don't need this, but your app might be can skyrocket like we have seen with the Angry Birds suddenly, right? And so basically, this is something where you would go then to the Google App Engine to make a scalable solution. There are other ways of creating apps. I think my, some of you may know from software engineering with Matthias Borg and so on. But here, of course, you have a very scalable solution. You have lots of Lego bricks and pieces already, not only be ready for you to use, but also have inherent scalability, right? When we talk about the different storage solutions, for instance. Hence, the Google App Engine is really um, based on the Google Cloud. Um, and many applications, of course, are based these days on this. It manages also quite nicely the whole process around the availability of the app, um, the, the different versions of the app, and, and so on. So this is something which also brings the benefits, the scalability and the support for many programming languages, of course, adds to its uh, basically idea that uh, many, many people use it in production. And you see here different testimonials again. And if you go, of course, to the websites, you see even more. Um, and here you see the story highlights for each of these, right? So cut annual IT overhead by $500,000 um, annually. Every year, some company, you know, cut the IT spending for half a million. So that are numbers where you can understand, okay, I rather spend something in the cloud in, instead of using my own data center, for instance. Then you see the orders of magnitudes of storage coming now to our topic in the course, big data, right? You would say 30 terabyte already is, is in the regime of, let's say, starting with big data, really. And you'd see that it scales really having no performance issues. This is something which a normal app developer has to show, has to deploy on, on really, let's say, cutting edge hardware and, and things like that. So that this all works is something which has, of course, Google inherent as the, as the Google Cloud. But this means um, also quite substantial power in terms of processing, in terms of, you know, let's say beautiful Lego blocks, which are in a rent also well designed, well developed to cope with the performance. And I will make a case for it when we talk about NoSQL and others. Hence, there are many benefits if you really go to the cloud. But of course, the prices remain. But you see also here in this example, you can actually cut also some prices if you're, let's say, a large player. Then this all should lead, of course, to an improved customer experience. It goes without saying, if you don't have an app that somebody likes, you don't want to use it. Some examples how you would use this um, for, let's say, a very 
simple application I taught you, a web application, you also similar like I had in the infrastructure as a service layer. But here you see how that works. You basically have the app engine from where everything started and then some cloud storage and so on. But here you already start with having dynamic content with Memcage and Tasto. So these are all the Lego bricks I mean that you have there for your disposal and you can just already use them. You don't have to implement them. They're very nicely working together in order to serve maybe for your web application some dynamic content. Um, you have this publish subscribe pattern, for instance, nicely support for monitoring or processing. Uh, you have some data flow. Again, these are all Lego bricks. You really put quickly together. Some of them I will come to in a moment. There's just an overview that you see a little bit. Again, the analogy of putting in this Lego bricks, right? So very um, you know, interesting building blocks, one to one put together, and they're all standing like BigQuery here, for instance, for very powerful, uh, implemented also very wisely, so to speak, and for performance, um, uh, Lego bricks in the Google App Store or basically in your own Google um, App Engine, and you make then the game app that you see here. When you then think about the backend for games, for instance, a game app is based on what you do in the App Engine, and then have again this interesting different building blocks that you then combine in order to um, have your own data processing done, uh, which is the logic then, of course, quickly of the, your application, but also the data that you need for the application. Uh, and then, of course, the BigQuery and other, let's say, Lego blocks we will talk about that you easily combine. So, of course, there's also the operations, as I talked to you. This is a process. So during this building, you have a cloud monitoring, logging, what happens if an error occurs, and also the tracing through basically your application logic, which is important. Hence, um, it's basically also very much optimized for app development, hence the name Google App Engine. Um, some of the pricing just for you to, to combine it again, while we talk about, uh, interesting to see is here, for instance, that the incoming network traffic is free, right, in this um, but already, ex let's say the outgoing network traffic is, um, you know, costs something. So this is a pattern that you sometimes see often in clouds, encouraging, of course, immigration to the Google Cloud, because then if you transfer, for instance, the 30 terabytes we have seen inside Google um, and you say, well, that's free, so I can easily migrate to Google. But let's say you work with Google three years, have 30 terabytes accumulated, like we see in the example. Now I want to move to Amazon. Here you go. Right. So for each of the gigabytes that you would, let's say, transfer over time, you need basically 12 cents. And this accumulates, you know, think about terabytes now versus gigabytes. And and this is just an example of um, traffic in general. So, of course, you could see everything accumulates, right, it's depending on the instances, depending on what you really put over the wire. Um, but of course, the, the kind of idea that you use an additional also services you see here, a search API, which is really fast and, and uh, per gigabyte, you have to pay the price for it, right? So still, of course, the, the big way is to say you only pay for what you use, but actually you see that quite everything has a price tag, right? Where you as developer think I do just a couple of queries. Um, you see already for 10,000 queries, which could be accumulated in a game um, very quickly, you already have, let's say, half a dollar or something. So in this sense, think also, of course, there's a pricing scheme to it, even if it's a development oriented one, not just having, let's say, compute time on a P3, P4, P5 instance we discussed last time on NVIDIA. No, here we're talking about the services or the usage of APIs, or basically the number of requests you put to certain, let's say, Lego bricks, right? How often you use a search API. So to, to bring across you something also which should have actually a, a whole university course almost, right? So, I mean, databases goes without saying, should be in the pocket of all computer scientists, but uh, the NoSQL databases are a bit a newer topic. Many of you have more, probably already learned about this, you know, the structured query language, about relational databases, uh, consistency models introduced by schemas. You have triggers, stored procedures in large databases. Let's say Oracle would be one example of those. Um, but there is a certain movement in the clouds, especially to have more read 
only oriented databases to have let's say databases which are not so let's say constrained in the consistency models so you open up um, and and that's why they are called actually also sometimes not only sql um, so in this sense you can uh, have them rather quicker with key values accessed rather than writing a large sql query now sql can be still a front of those um, as we have already used with some um, basically beforehand and uh, this means lots of interesting aspects like um, interesting appending operations, for instance. We said in the cloud, often things accumulate in storage. Um, actually, people are very hesitant of, of deleting, right? So this is mostly also when you think you, you do an app game, you advance as a user, you advance, more levels are getting free. There's more and more information that the app is storing for you than removing, right? So I've been, you know, going through this and this, have gained so many points, whatever it is. Um, there's more pending operations and delete operations. And mostly it's read, 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 right? Read lots of information. Think about now the level information that many people want to have, let's say, in Angry Birds, right? When you shoot these birds through the air. So there's always a level that is somehow created. And I hope that everybody of you has at least seen once Angry Birds, how it works. Uh, I assume that now by now, because over the last couple of years, everybody has said in the class always Angry Birds, we know. So I can say that's a de facto standard these days. But um, think about how that works also. You play a game, you have rules there, you have basically lots of retrieval from information for levels, for the characters, the birds, for basically you as a user, how far you are. And the updates of this is, is basically very little. And this is why these NoSQL databases strive in performance so much and, and are really optimized to this. So... And I give you, of course, some examples now in the in the part. And this is really optimized in a way for accumulation data of times. I don't want to say that SQL databases are not good, right? They're still, especially when you have uh, good indexes in databases, key for many applications. But here for big data especially, um, we have seen lots of interesting applications where that really outperform SQL databases. So some business cases, uh, no no sql cloud data store again is something um, which is used for instance by philips here i mean many of you know already the philips hue this you know steering your lightning at the home um, basically with an app and this is lots of lots of transactions per day and that's where also now think about the costs i was saying to you right with philips has to incorporate 200 million transactions per day right of, of doing this you know ah, i want to have more light less light etc so they use a Google Cloud platform, they pay for it, but with this, of course, have benefits that they don't need to have their own big data center and can concentrate basically the Philips engineers on creating cool ideas or new product lines, um, which are all based now on the smartphone idea. And you see that again here when you come to the testimonial, you can all of that, of course, look more in detail if you want on the references I provided here, the Philips case study. Uh, the background, because it scales in instantly, is a very important part of it. They never will know how many people buy how many lamps, right, somewhere in their home. Is it five? Is it ten? Uh, they don't know if people in America buy much more than maybe in Germany. Of course, they do some analytics, but they're not really preparing this. So in this sense, it's completely scalable, the solutions, by going to the cloud, while in other ways you have probably also to think about different data centers from Philips and so on. You see here some, some of the benefits. It runs a platform time, ten, ten times at scale of other projects. Um, you know, the, the, the number of transactions that you really have to um, sustain by so many users. And think about you want to do, you know, increased light in your, um, you know, in your home and then it would not work. I mean, you see that it has to go with a user experience. It has to be performant. Otherwise, you will probably not like this Philips Hue and then you will not use it anymore. Hence, of course, this is a big benefit for the Google Cloud here in, in these customer areas of Philips for providing something which scales up very easily. Just a couple of things to this NoSQL-based cloud stores. And this is, as I said, a whole lecture um, series of the university normally, right? So this is nothing I can just bring across in a couple of slides here. So I just give it to you as a, something you have to really think about because this is a complete different way how you think about data 
than you probably learned in the SQL databases. Um, you can have interfaces similar to it, but um, the idea is really thinking more about the data itself, right? Flexible data structures, LAMP move from A into B, changes, okay, scaling the solutions, more and more users. So that's why basically also Philips thinks much more about such a storage of this NoSQL data. Um, and uh, here is a good example how Philips then can use it. So um, here you see some of the building blocks to enable this. You have the Cloud Big Table, which is a NoSQL white column database, which is often used really to get access to low latency. Then you have the Firestore, another document NoSQL database. And I come to these differences a little bit in a moment, but as I said, each of them fill easily these days with all the different implementations in the open source, for instance, as well, a whole lecture, and also with the ideas. Do you have then the NoSQL cloud database for storing, syncing data in real time? All of these are unique selling propositions or this Lego bricks I was alluding to for very specific purposes. But one key message to take away perhaps for this NoSQL stores and, and you know key value pair stores is exactly what you see here. Not every user has the same information, right? Think about Facebook. People basically put out information very differently. Some have the whole, let's say, live there. Some have just an email or basically just a name. Uh, and you see here how that works. You would have a key, uh, which then stands, for instance, for the different users that you have there. But you see the values are more in a key value store fashion. The email, you don't have an email for the other one, but it's not a problem and you don't have the location for the first, it's also not a problem. So you see the information is differently stored here. And when you have a SQL database, you would need to have you know fields for all of that. You have an email, you have an ID, you have a first name, location, phone, for all of these users. And you see that only some of them will be filled. Now, when you put that to Facebook with, let's say, maybe 200 things you can expose, then you have 200 fields and the people maybe here and there just use 10. So in this sense, um, we see already the, the kind of uh, general fundamental idea is that basically from the data perspective, although you have a similar idea of a user, they are all different, right? Which we call here sometimes also bins. Um, so hence, general characteristics um, of this cloud big data, scalability, it, it scales to petabytes of data. So the 30 terabytes we have seen was just the beginning. Um, it has a nice, um, let's say, idea of combining this then but for things with MapReduce, right? So then do analytics on it, which is another idea, of course. You don't want to just store data. You want to do perform some analytics on it, maybe also within your game to do some statistics. And you see here um, some, let's say, impacts again, again from a partner, which is, you know, here, uh, Doe Jones, um, that you have really interesting you know, benefits across the scene for many, many different users uh, in finance, in earth sciences, and so on by using this NoSQL database. And this could be many applications. Here is, for instance, something for finance, where you see finance relies on, on accurate time series data about companies. Um, you can have this either in streaming coming in or basically as a batch processing coming in. And you need Lego building blocks that you have as data flow there to process this time series and then, of course, storing some data, which is a big query or the cloud big table that we already have seen now and the storage solution. So you would basically put different elements in different storages and then want to basically do some analytics on it. So because these are all nicely created Lego bricks, they all fit to each other. So you can combine these storages with the AI platform doing machine learning, data proc, doing something we already learned with HD Insight, essentially all the MapReduce, Apache Spark applications, and then also, let's say, data mining and so on with Data Lab. Hence, that is now the, the benefit, really, of creating these kind of things. And you think about the Google Big ta Table here, it's also a very important Lego brick um, that you can see and alludes a little bit what we had before with, you know, thinking here as an application of pointing to websites. That's where you would store web pages, basically, you would have a reversed idea of an URL pointing then to basically the idea of this NoSQL um, that you have. And in a normal database, SQL database, you have now, you know, in different times, times of the web page, different things to do, which could add up now to many different fields. And of course, many different entries for the rows. And, and this is something where maybe there are lots of empty fields again, 
So another way would be to use then really this SQL, bait, this NoSQL data store. You have unstructured data, yes, but still it comes with lots of benefits like easy to deploy, to implement. Um, you can have no schemas, which makes it a bit relaxed really to work with. And of course, as I said, the SQL databases are still in use for very good purposes in, let's say, applications where you really have to have all data for all users the same and you really re require that, that might be applications that really do this. Um, but of course, here from us in the in the cloud course, many applications really benefit from the idea um, that you have essentially, um, you know, unstructured data a lot, and this helps us. Now, there will be lecture 15 talking also a little bit to it, also about graph databases in addition. So it's really for specific data um, that you have here. You have column-based stores, um, with having information, you have this document oriented based ones, and you see there are quite a big bunch of open source implementations, even uh, for databases around all of these different approaches to NoSQL database. We talked about key value based approaches already, and the graph one will be something we address then more in lecture 15. So it's a huge jungle out there, um, and to just understanding them, maybe coming back to our examples with a web page, you have this reversed all and the different timestamps. and in a more conceptual view, so a relational database view, you see that like this, right? You basically have the no no updates here in this time series. You have suddenly an anchor update here. Um, then you have different contents here. It doesn't matter exactly what that is. It's just more for you to understand their differences in fields. And the rest here is all empty. So how you would rather do this uh, in the physical view, using now a NoSQL store or column store, uh, your Apache HBase here, for instance, you would just have basically then uh, these ideas of having no empty fields, um, having different, of course, the row key has to be the same, but then you have in this timestamps, you see them here, that is the same timestamp, just really the, the column and, and where the content is rather there or the anchor is rather there. So the column becomes, so to speak, the, the sort of value, right, in this different timestamps and the different row keys. And, and these are different ones. So, I mean, basically you have the same row key which brings them together, but you have no empty fields anymore given basically this approach of the column store. Um, and there are many of those examples. We can go now to JSON using this with a MongoDB, for instance, uh, is another type of how you would do it that every, let's say, object you have there um, is not anymore this full schema oriented person or everybody has an email, everybody has a phone number. You see here user information is differently, um, you know, and, and this is then the idea of how to use these kind of NoSQL databases. Here's another example using, for instance, JSON style documents as a data model, which is quite well supported in the document store MongoDB. Um, and I could go on and go on. There's Cassandra very much known. Um, you see here, um, this is another key value store idea of the different um, people here. And it's also nice that it's a little bit, um, let's say, oriented already towards distributed computing, right? Which is also the NoSQL database. It was also alluding to a little bit here, you know, that this could be maybe also on different servers, uh, alluding again to the idea here. And here also the documents could be on different areas. So these are often also having this in mind, what you see here nicely with Cassandra, right? So um, that you would have these databases already modified in a way that they can be even put on different nodes in your, let's say, distributed cloud. And that makes them, of course, also quite nice compared to the big, let's say, Oracle SQL database that has to be somewhere in some physical location. In a way, that's all really all I wanted to leave you on the table for the first part. Uh, I know this NoSQL walkthrough was a bit fast because, as I said, normally you need uh, maybe a whole university course today because there's so many facets to it. But also, I think it should be a little bit known as computer scientists that there's a world beyond uh, SQL. I brought you a little bit of video, a very short one, just to look a little bit on the Google App Engine. Again, I'm not paid by Google, that not just that you know, but I think it's on this level of path, a very good example. So I stop here the recording and please have a look at the video.